I have a 20-20-20 rule that I follow, four 20s. First 20, your first 20 years of growing up, don't make big mistakes. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't make royally big mistakes. Yeah. And you know which ones I'm talking about. I know about. which ones you're not talking about. not saying make the small ones. You're going to do them. Yeah. No one's, you don't walk on water. Just don't make them. Yeah. In the car with a guy that's selling a kilo of coke and you're in there and he gets arrested. You get arrested. Distribution. You go get a felony. It's just like, dude, you could pre- if you can prevent those big ones, yeah. good for you, right? Happened, happened. Try to clean it up. But hopefully first 20 years, you don't make the big mistakes. Next 20 years. Find one industry, lock in, become the best, make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Minimum ten million, upwards of a hundred million dollars. If you can make it net 20 worth to 40. Or, net worth or in regards to what do you mean by ten million? By forty have a net worth of a hundred million. Okay, by forty. By forty <laughs> have a net worth of a hundred million. I love you, Patrick. Yeah. By forty have a net worth of a hundred million minimum. Yo, what's good everybody? This is Hafiz and welcome to another episode of The Roommates. Guys, I am so glad you all are here because I know you've seen the thumbnail, guys. I had to come back to Florida. You know I was there the entire month of February. I mean January. I had to come back to Florida for one of my favorite people of all time guys i always tell you guys find digital mentors who can inspire you who can encourage you who can uplift you who can make you into better men so there's nobody there's absolutely nobody who helped me more than this guy in regards to my business in regards to motivation in regards to encouragement so without further ado i'm not going to spend too much time please guys welcome to the show the one and only patrick beck david Patrick, it's a privilege to be back in your presence. It's good to be with you. First of all, congratulations to you guys. Last time, I think you had 50 or 60,000 yeah. subs. You're at uh, probably by the time this thing goes up, it's going to be over a quarter million subs. You yeah. guys are on your way to a million subs. You yeah. ought to be excited. This no, is good. No, man. I, it, it is, it's been a blessing, you know, because as you know, when you're doing any business, at the first couple of years, that's a, that's a trying year. Yes. When you're not seeing the, you know, the results that, you know, society and, and it's, it's telling you you're supposed to experience. Mm-hmm. And so I think it was that consistent grind, that consistent patience. And we'll talk about it more. You know it the best. Um, COVID was a time to strike yep. if you were a content creator and you had a video that came out when you were talking about how everybody else was shutting down and you doubled down and that excited me so much and we literally followed that same path and I, I love seeing your results and we also have those similar results as well. Ex- very excited for you guys. Yeah. And when you came that time we spent time to get I felt genuineness, humility, hunger, curiosity, work ethic, determination and those qualities are going to help you win. Thank you so much, Patrick. So, man, I, so many things I want to talk about. Um, are we allowed to talk about the move? Do whatever you want to talk cool. about. All in. The move is very curious to me because I, yeah. I didn't expect it. What was, what was going into your mind making the move to Florida? I just saw that you were in such an amazing position in Dallas. Yeah, and, and I was. Here's the thing. So okay. I live, for those that don't know, I lived in California for 24 years. Okay. Right? So minus the military Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina. I'm in California for 24 years. And there came a time where one day I'm in my office and this tax guy just shows up and says, man, I speak with uh, Patrick Bed David. So, you know, the girls bring it back to me. I said, yeah, yeah, how you doing? Says, well, here's my business card. I'm a, I'm a, the the local tax assessor for LA County. Sure. No problem. Mm. Uh, You owe us some 70 to $80,000. I said, what for? (laughs) I said, I pay my state, I pay my federal, I pay my, I pay everything. What is this all about? We know you're growing. Here's what you need to pay. Mm. So I call my CPA. I said, what is this all about? They said, well, you need to pay it. It's hit and miss. Mm. One in every 5,200 business that they found out you're growing, they found out online you're growing. They came to you, you have to pay for it. Mm. I said, what counties in California do I not pay for it, mm. right? So they told me, well, you know, it's going to be Glendale Burbank because of Hollywood, Santa Monica, Victorville. It was like 13 of them. Mm -hmm. So I moved from Woodland Hills to Glendale. That was my first sign of trying to go to a more small business friendly community. So I went to Glendale. I went to a building called 801 North Brand. It's the New York Life building with Equinox right in front of it, right off the 134 freeway. Then all of a sudden I started reading all these things. You know, Time Magazine came out with a uh, magazine titled the United States of Texas. <laughs> and they said for every two people leaving California to Texas, only one goes from Texas to California. Wow. So everyone's leaving. And to get a U-Haul from Texas to California is only 300 bucks. And to get a U-Haul from California to Texas is $3,000. Wow. Let me say that one more time. 300 mm. to take the U-Hauls back to California, mm-hmm. but 3000 
from California to Texas. Those were the numbers I'm giving you. It could be a few hundred dollars up. But the point is, they had no U-Hauls left in uh, California because everybody was leaving. But they had a ton of U-Hauls in Texas because no one is leaving. Mm. So then we moved our family and our business to Texas, Dallas, which on a golf score is probably one of the best places to live in America. Entrepreneur, business owner, taxes, regulation. You got all the sports. You want stars, hockey, you got it. Baseball, Rangers, you got it. Mavs, you got Cowboys. You got the whole night. Great restaurants, great hotels, convention, the whole night. So then where does Florida come into this uh, deal? So now I'm running two companies. I'm mm-hmm. running an insurance company with 18,000 agents. Today we're growing. We have nearly 150 offices nationwide. We're, you know, our numbers our last five years, no matter what top line revenue, minimum 40% we've grown. Some years 60%, some years 50%. EBITDA's grown at a very, very fast pace. And so then media company, I'm sitting there saying, why move to Florida? So we looked at Greenwich, okay, Greenwich, where I would live in Greenwich and I would go to New York, Manhattan for the media company, Valuetainment. And I looked at California, Newport. I know my contacts in California, but then COVID happened. Mm. The moment COVID happened, the way Newsom and Cuomo handled those two states made me say California, New York, South. Mm. So once those two were out, I knew I wasn't going to stay in Dallas long term. I wanted lifestyle for my kids. I want to be close to the water. So I came to Florida. So in a perfect world, if California and Texas had a baby, yeah. it would be Florida. Man. So decided to come to Florida, and uh, uh, we're very happy. The kids are very happy, and my wife's very happy. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. One of the things I've admired about you, Patrick, is you're, you, you're such a visionary. You're such a man, like you're talking about in the book, who's always playing chess. I don't know if you remember this or not, but the first time we met, you showed me the Wayne Gretzky card. I think that's when you may have been first time you got it. Wow. But you showed me the Wayne Gretzky card. And I showed it in the interview. That's yeah, right. Yeah, you showed yeah, it to yeah, me yeah. during the interview. And you opened when... the box and you showed it to me. You showed me all yeah. these cards. And you're like, look at this card. I got it for People a million. People thought I was nuts that yeah. I spent a half a million dollars on two cards. Mm-hmm. I remember you telling me about that. Yeah. But you were like, wait and see what's going to happen. Yeah. And literally, I was like, I'm always watching your channel, and I saw that video that you posted about the profit that you made when you sold that card. And I was like, man, that visionary mindset of Patrick Bet David is so inspirational. And then when I see you drop the book, your next five steps, everything clicked because it, it literally they could see that what you're teaching in the book is not so much a message of, of encouragement that you've read somewhere, but practical application that you've done in your everyday life. Yeah, so it, it's so funny you bring that up because when I bought the card, everybody's like, what are you doing spending this kind of money on a card? Who the hell is going to do anything? No one even follows hockey. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no one follows hockey. You don't know what hockey's yeah, all about, yeah. right? So. Then uh, the two cards ended up uh, selling at a record. One of them sold for $720,000, and the other card sold for $1.291 million. Mm. So in a span of 18 months, I think I ended up making $1.3 million Mm. on two cards. Wow. Right? Two pieces of paper, 1.3. Now it's the other way around, right? Now cards are overpriced. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jordan PSA 10, 1986 Fleer, a year ago was selling for $40,000. One just sold for $738. Wow. Very overpriced. So wow. this, is a, this is a very different time right now with the market. But yeah, you know, uh, I think something we don't do enough is a following. I think something we don't do enough is following. We don't sit there. They say Napoleon, anytime before he went to war, he would take a week, sit in a room with a lot of paper and stuff to write on, and he would just strategize, mm-hmm. okay? What if we did this? What if the enemy did this? What's their strength? Who's the strength? Who's the best general here? Who does he have? How many soldiers did he have? What, which one? And then he would look at the maps and think about the quality of maps back then, terrain, mm-hmm. like the mountains, you know, the water, all this stuff. You don't have the kind of map that we have today. So yeah. he's using, you know, low quality stuff that it's just, hey, I think this is what it looks like and it's this many miles away and this many kilometers away. But he would sit there. Then he would come back out and have a meeting with his soldiers and say, hey, here's what we're going to be doing. Mm. You and your soldiers are going here. This unit, you're going here. If they attack from here is this. The strength of this army is this. The strength of the army is this. Here's what they're going to be doing. This is the seasons. Who's trained to be able to do this? You guys have been most prepared to go on the mountain terrain. You're going to go here. You guys have been most for forest. You're going to go here. You guys have been in cold. You guys. So then he would put his plan of action and then he would go out and they would ask him and say, hey, Napoleon, whose strategy do you use the most when it comes down to war? You know what his answer was? No one's. Mm. That's what made him predictable, mm. unpredictable, right? So mm. the enemy didn't know what he was going to do. Yeah. Because if you reveal you're using someone's strategy, guess what the enemy's going to do? 
I know exactly what your next move is going to be. Then, then there's that element of, you know, I know exactly what you're going to do, so I know how to pivot myself. So in life, it's the same exact thing. And by the way, this isn't about being a billionaire. This isn't about being a millionaire. This isn't about Ferraris and Lambos and 20,000 square foot homes on the ocean. And this isn't about that. This isn't about having dinner with, uh, with the presidents and all. No, nope. this is you. There's seven and a half billion people living in the world. There's no one in the world that's more important than you, to you. Mm -hmm. What I mean by, I don't mean selfishly. I mean, no, my son, I'm spending time with him right now. Today was at the office and they just left right now. We're at lunch, we're having this seafood, right? I'm having some oysters and he's sitting there in a the corner. From the moment he sat down, he knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He wanted to play the Santa Claus game. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times he asked me, Dad, can I play the Santa Claus game? Dad, can I play the Santa Claus game? Mm -hmm. Can I play it now? I said, Dad, one minute, Dad, I'm on the phone. One minute later, Dad, it's been a minute. Can I play the game now? Can I play the game? He is so persistent. Mm. It's ridiculous mm. how many times he asked me what he wants. His brother slightly different. His sister slightly different. What he likes my middle one doesn't like. My youngest doesn't. My youngest temperament is demanding. Mm -hmm. She wants everything. You better respect what she mm -hmm. wants. So as these guys age, I can't say, hey, why don't you go be an entrepreneur like your dad? It's not going to be the case. Mm -hmm. They're all going to be different because the most important person that matters in the equation of knowing what you want to do next is who? You. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters. So if I sit down in quiet time and I say, let's just say I'm Bobby, Johnny, Patrick, Hafiz, whoever you are, you're sitting there saying, you know, what do I really want to do? Let me tell you, when I grew up, I remember when I was going through this and I saw Foster and da 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 da. Here's what I want to do. Yesterday, I interviewed a guy that's a former CIA agent. I don't know if you've seen the movie Jack Ryan. He's the real life Jack Ryan. Wow. Former CIA agent that was a pararescue agent that's now, his entire mission today is human trafficking. Why human trafficking? Mm. Like, why did he wake up one day want to do human trafficking? Foster care is where he came out of. 60% mm. of human trafficking comes out. So look at the connection of what drove him to want to do that. Yeah. Make sense? 100%. I grew up extremely poor. I grew up not having anything. I'm a welfare kid. I escaped Iran to come here. So politically, why am I such a protective capitalism and entrepreneurship? Because I've been on the other side where you can't say anything. You better be quiet. You got to walk on eggshells. But that's my story. Mm -hmm. What's yours? What's the individual's? I think very, very rarely do people take the most important time out of the life, which is your time out. Mm. And you sit there quietly and say, okay, I'm 28 years old. What have I done so far? Yeah. Not much. I'm not happy with it. I'm 42 years old. What's the next move? And then you sequence it out and then you go execute. I love that, Patrick. So let me tell you a story about what happened this year. Um, like I said, I think we started, sorry, 2020. Started in 2020, roughly about 54,000 subscribers. Um, and so, like I said, around February, March, everybody was shutting down. Watch your video, really inspire me. I said, no, we're, we're, we're tripling the content. We're gonna, we're gonna produce, we're gonna produce, we're gonna produce. By the time August hit, we're about 80,000, about like 79, 80,000 subscribers. So just six months ago, you are at 80,000. Yeah. So literally, all of a sudden, just things just started unfolding. And we had a back catalog because what happened is we had a back catalog. It's just we just lacked brand awareness. You're a business guy. You know, it's product and placement. You have the greatest product, but if it's not placed in front of your audience, they not be, they won't be able to buy it. So when the audience finally saw the product, we went wow. from literally 80,000 subscribers in beginning of August to 200,000 by November. And so what ends up happening is we, like I said, we interview a lot of people. We've interviewed Candace Owens. We've interviewed you, you know, Gary V, Ben Shapiro. We're interviewing people for all different backgrounds. But one of the things that guys are always focusing on a lot of times is the dating videos, like the relationship stuff. The guys are fans of that. And then what, and then I got to a point where a lot of those guys were then reaching out to me, complaining about where they were at in life where they're at, why they couldn't get certain girls, why they couldn't get certain things. And I said, okay, who are you? Where is your plan? Where are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? What, what business plans have you put in your life? No answer. And then I said, you know what makes me mad about you guys? I interviewed one of my favorite people, Patrick Bet David. Last year, none of you guys watched it. He gave so much free information that will benefit you guys' life, but you're watching all the entertainment videos instead. Yep. I kind of went on a rant literally that day. I think like 10,000 people watched the video, and I got so many messages from young men telling me, I found Valuetainment. Thank you so much. Patrick's amazing. Get him back on the show. Get him back on the show. So the past five months, I've been bothering Kai to make sure I get you back on yeah, the I'm show. Yeah, I got to give you credit. Yeah. You said 
And the guy's like, I'm like, 30 minutes. He said, no, Pat. He's saying one hour. Guy's yeah. like, hey, 30 <laughs> minutes. Like, Look, I'm coming in for an hour. You <laughs> yeah. got your hour. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You stayed for I got it from your you. book. You know what I yes. mean? You demand what you want in yes. life and, and be I persistent respect, for that. And I respect that. Thank you so I much, sir. I respect that. I yeah. respect that approach. Good for you. Thank you so much. So so eventually what happened is that a lot, of, I realized so many guys, like you said, did not have a plan. Mm -hmm. So many guys did not have a path. And one of the videos I always recommend is your video where you talk about how to make a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Because you really break it down piece by piece, mm -hmm. outsmart, out strategize, mm -hmm. out work, all these great things. And so I'm so excited about your book, you know, because I think it's going to help so many young men, especially those who grew up without fathers, be able to get concise plans mm -hmm. to become the man that they want to be. So what made you decide to write your new book? And what are some of the, what are some of the feedback you've been getting as you've been receiving some of the um, people sharing their opinions? So, so your next five moves. So the, the whole thing got started with one day I woke up and I was in my mid-20s, and my girlfriend sent me a message in text, and she says, we're breaking up. You spend way too much time working. Uh, I love you, but long-term, I don't see this thing working out because you're working 100 hours a week. It's just not going to work out. So 6 a.m., then I get a call from my mom, guilt. She says, what happened to my baby boy that used to call me more and tell me, you don't call me anymore, you don't do this, do you still love your mom, right? <laughs> so first feeling, emotion is what heartbreak. Second one is guilt. Mm. Next one I get is a client of mine that says, I cancel what I just bought from me, that's a $10,000 commission. Oh, Lots no. of money for me at that time. Then my number one sales guy quit. So mm. heartbreak, guilt, cost, money, I need that money. And then my number one sales guy quits, pressure. So mm. I'm sitting there saying, who do I call first? Mm. What do I do first, right? Do I first call my mom and, mom, I'm so sorry, you know I love you and send her a gift and all that, so I'm gonna go take her out to lunch? Well then if I do that for the rest of my life, I'm train her, training her to use guilt to get what she wants out of me. Is that really what I wanted? I think a lot of times we teach our kids to use guilt to get what they want out of us. Mm. We don't even know we're doing it. That's good. So then uh, uh, I said, girlfriend, okay, do I call her back and say, oh my gosh, babe, just come over. I'll do anything for you. I'll take the whole day off. I'll take the week <laughs> off. Then I'm compromising my vision long-term of who I want to be. No matter how great the sex is, no matter how beautiful she is, no matter how whatever it is, is it me compromising? I don't know if it's worth me compromising my vision. Ah, I don't know what I'm gonna do there. Do I call, so eventually I said, what does the most successful person today, if they were my age right now, 25, what would they have done right now? Mm. So then I made the decision based on that. I said, okay, let me first call the client to get intel about the sales guy because the sales guy and I are the ones that did the client sale. So maybe he's gonna tell me more stuff about the sales guy. So I called the client, client says, yeah, here's why, you know, you're, uh, you know, I talked to one of your agents and he told me that there's a policy going on over here that's going to be cheaper. So I said, oh, interesting. I got into, I said, let me ask you a question. Are you fully out? Or if I can help you out with this and get, you know, Pat, I'm not fully out. I just, you know, he confused me a little. I said, let me make one phone call. Then I called my agent. My agent was worried that we were about to sell, lose the client. So he was resigning. I said, listen, it's not going to be done. Let's go meet with the client. So the first thing I did is I went and met with the client. Mm -hmm. So I saved that. I saved the agent, they stuck around. That probably ended up making me additional $200,000 the next two years, mm. which I needed at that time, because I was broke. Yeah. Then I had the conversation with my girl, and I gave her the most ridiculous, uh, <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, ultimatum? Uh, it was a very weird ultimatum, okay. because I said to her, I said, you know, we've been together for two years. Mm -hmm. I love you, I know you love me too. I say we go 30 days without sex, mm. and see how we do. Because we're gonna find out if we're gonna be together long term, if we have anything in common, or is it just a, we have way too much fun together. Mm -hmm. So first time we go out Friday night, we go to the movies, we come back in the movies. I got a big expedition with plenty of room in the back. Mm -hmm. And she looks at me, what do you wanna do? I'm like, I gotta drop you off. Mm. So we sit in the uh, expedition to see what we can talk about. It's really not much to be talking about. Mm. Nothing, like we're just like family, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll see you, I'll see you. One week, two weeks, three weeks, we kinda pretty much know. Mm. We're either gonna stay together because of how much fun we're having, but we know long term we're not gonna be together. By the way, we're friends still today. Yeah. She runs a successful business, I help her out, or even my wife is friends with her. Oh, wow. Very interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then, that left. My mom, that was never gonna change. So yeah. I had to make sure she knew. Mom, I just want you to know, I'm pursuing my dreams. I love you, you're important to me, but at the same time, I can't. So everything about this book is, what do I need to be doing first, mm. then second, then third, then fourth? Initially, my title was Your Next 15 Moves. Mm. But Simon & Schuster says 15 is too big of a number, start yeah. off with five. But in the book, I explain 15 moves is what the masters do. Mm. The average chess player, when they play with you, they only know their one move. Here's what I'm doing next. Yeah. 
the pros know three to five moves. Mm. So the masters know 10 moves and the grandmasters know their next 15 moves, mm. right? So in business, it's the same thing. Most people are like, oh, what do I do? Just make phone calls. Okay, let me go sell. Versus one guy that's an older, well, I'm going to sell. Once I get to 100000 I'm going to ask the guy if he lets me open up an office over here. Then I'm going to go find this customer. Then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to open up my fifth office when I'm making a half a million. Then I'm going to go and be a broker. And then I'm going to make my million uh, five years from now. And when I do, I'm going to buy that condo at this place. Everything's about then when I, 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 mm. versus what do I do today? Mm -hmm. So there is an element of long-term planning mm -hmm. and what my moves are going to be. And that's the part with sequence. And look, I'm 42 years old. You're what in your age? Okay, so 30. I have a 20-20-20 rule that I follow. Four 20s. First 20, your first 20 years of growing up, don't make big mistakes. Mm -hmm. Don't don't make royally big mistakes. Yeah. And you know which ones I'm talking I about. I know which one you're Not talking saying about. saying make the small ones. You're going to do them. Yeah. No one's, you don't walk on water. Just don't make them. Yeah. In the car with a guy that's selling a kilo of Coke and you're in there and he gets arrested. You get arrested distribution you go get a felony it's just like dude you could pre if you can prevent those big ones yeah. good for you right happened happened try to clean it up but hopefully first 20 years you don't make the big mistakes next 20 years find one industry lock in become the best make a lot of money mm -hmm. minimum 10 million upwards of 100 million dollars if you can make it net 20 worth to 40. Or net worth or in regards to what do you mean by 10 million by 40 have a net worth of 100 million Okay, by 40. <laughs> by 40, have a net worth of 100 million. I love you, Patrick. Yeah. By 40, have a net worth of 100 million minimum because you're, you're going to, listen, anything you give 15 to 20 years to as an industry, if you give it everything you got, you're going to make that kind of money. Mm. No question. Mm. No question about it. So you may say, I want to be a great podcaster. You take this thing to 10 million subs, you're killing it. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Spotify comes up to you, says $85 million contract we're giving you. You don't know what's going to happen, right? Yeah. There's a business model to the madness as well. Mm -hmm. Then from 40 to 60 is taking that money you made mm -hmm. and using creative. You still can manage your businesses, but using creative on what you want to do next. You always mm -hmm. wanted to do movies. Now you can do it. Mm -hmm. You want to do music. Now you can do it. You want to go buy art. Now you can do it. You wanted to go out there and do real estate investments, maybe be a small owner of a sports team. Now you can do it. And then yeah. 60 to 80, politics and giving back. Yeah. Very simple. So for me, it's all about the plans, 2020, 2020. And you know exactly what you want to do next. So if you're 30, you're like, by 39, I should be doing X, Y, Z. Mm. So that's why I wrote that book. I absolutely love that, Patrick. And, and and let me tell you something which really moved me when you wrote the book. The beginning, dedication. You dedicated it to your father. Yep. And you said, you, you said he was my Aristotle. And I think a lot of people didn't catch that. Because a lot of people are not history buffs the way you and I are. Because what happened was one of the greatest leaders of all time was Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great had one was the son of Philip of Macedon, who was also another one of the greatest leaders of all time. Mm -hmm. And Alexander had so much support and he had his mentor was Aristotle as well. So you, when you think about your, your father is this powerful dominant warlord, but then he gives you one of the wisest men to ever walk the face of the earth as a mentor, to be able to sharpen your mind as you're sharpening your body, which may, which by age of 32, Alexander literally conquered mm -hmm. literally most of the, the yep. known world at that time. Yep. So I, I love that because it meant to me how much your father meant to you, how much wisdom and information and, 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 and advice and how he really blossomed you as a man. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of young men don't have that. A lot of men don't have an Aristotle the way you do it and the father that I did. And a lot of them are lost and a lot of them are confused, which is why I'm always recommending your book. So for a lot of these young men who don't have a father like yours, who don't have that guidance and direction, who are even confused about step number one, what is some advice that you would give to that, those guys who are just trying to take that first initial step? So, so you know, my dad, what he passed down to me, think about it. I got a friend of mine the other day who called me. He says, look, Pat, I watch your videos. He says, what you're passing down to your kids is books and reading and knowledge. He says, that wasn't me. What I'm passing down to my kids is soccer. I was a great soccer, soccer player. So he coaches his kids in soccer in ways I could never do, ever do. His eight, nine-year-old kid in soccer, I, videos were sent to me. Let me tell you, he'll do laps around my kids, <laughs> not because maybe of the kid, mm -hmm. 
Mm. Maybe it's because of the father yeah. is a great teacher. I'm not a great teacher when it comes down to soccer yeah. or baseball or basketball, but I know how to pass this down to you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. My dad was never the entrepreneur. My dad was never the uh, uh, businessman. My dad wasn't a millionaire. My dad, you know, we've all always lived in an apartment complex. We never had a house. My dad wasn't, he was a cashier at a 99 cent store. He wasn't like, if you went to Inglewood, Great Western Forum's there. A mile away, my dad was at a 99 cent store, right across from a KFC and right next to a 2020 store. And when my parents got a divorce, when we left Iran, I was 10 years old. 10 or 12, I didn't see my dad because we lived in a refugee camp. My dad was back in, uh, back in, he went from Iran to Chicago down to LA. Then when we came to LA at 12, he sent somebody to our house when we were living in Doran in Glendale, right next to Virgil's. He said, the lady said, uh, uh, Patrick's father would like to see him and his sister. And mom says, do you guys want to see him? I'm like, yeah, I want to see him. So I went and saw my dad, and I saw my dad once a month mm -hmm. for the next six years. Then I joined the Army for three years, then I came back. So, But what did my dad pass down to me? Here's, here's what my dad's the Aristotle of my life. Okay. My dad passed down to me hard work mm -hmm. like you wouldn't believe. My dad passed down to me, if you say you're going to start something, you better finish it. My dad passed down to me, never be afraid of the truth, never. He says, don't win with, with your fist. Win with results and your words. Never win with your fist because there's no point there, right? He, he taught me values and principles. He would sit there and say, think about this. You know, Patrick, you're too hurry sometimes. You know, if you want to, if you put a seed right in a watermelon, how long will it take? I'm like, what is this guy talking about? You know, what are you talking about? Yeah. If you want a baby, how long does it take? Why does God say 40 weeks? You can't just go have a baby today and have it tomorrow. Business is the same way. You have to be. So he went, he, he brought the values and principles side mm. on what it took place. Now, somebody doesn't have that. Okay. There's a 52 year, 55 year old man just started a YouTube channel last year. Yep. And in the first 90 days, he got a million subscribers. Remember you talking You know about what the that. channel is? The, the, it's called Dad How Do I. Exactly. By the way, he only uploaded five videos. I saw it. Okay, it wasn't like, and none of his videos got 50 million views. Mm. One of his videos got a million views, but a guy on Facebook posted the Facebook video of that, and that video went viral and said, let's help this dad get to a million subscribers. So people got behind it. Yeah. And it's called Dad How Do I. So what does he do? He shows people how to change a you know leak you got in plumbing okay he shows you how to paint the wall he shows you that how do i paint that how do i fix it? that how do i change the oil mm -hmm. very basic video that he made okay what's the point there here's the point um there is nobody that grew up with a perfect family none of us do sometimes you, you look at the kid like oh look at that kid man he's so lucky you know mom and dad christians and they live in a 10 million dollar home and they got nice cars and look at the mom and dad and all this other stuff you have no idea that dad's got a cocaine addiction. You have no idea the mom and dad fight it. You have no idea that they don't even sleep in the same bed. You don't know everyone's drama, but mm -hmm. everyone's got some kind of drama. So I think one of the things that helped me is the following. When I would look at my uh, 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 lack of in an area of my life, and I was like, oh my gosh, but man, my parents got a divorce. Oh my gosh, but you know, I'm a one point at GPA. Oh my gosh, look at me, you know, I'm from Iran. Nobody wants to buy insurance from you know, guy that's Iranian when 9 11 just happened. I would hear all that stuff that you're fe I'm feeding myself, right? Mm. I had one rule I followed. Listen, if you can talk, if you can walk, if you can see, if you can hear, if you can taste, if you can smell, if you speak a language, if your mind works and you can do enough of that, you can do whatever you want to do in your life, mm. period. Mm. I don't need a, an alibi. I don't need an excuse. So for some people that is a father, for some it's a mother. Mm. For some it's abuse. For some it's parents that were there but hardcore abuse, mm. which is sometimes worse than not having a father exactly. because if there's hardcore abuse, that abuse can go to a lot of different levels, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, sitting there and, and wondering about what we lacked and all this other stuff, um, you know, almost always for the rest of your life, you will always use an alibi with that. I had a guy that told me, and he said, uh, messaging him right now, and he says, well, you know, you don't understand what's, oh, for example, perfect example to give you. We have two events going on this week, okay? Uh, one is in Dallas, one is in Louisville. Both of them are expected to have two to 4,000 people at their events, okay? Mm. Dallas and Louisville. Now watch this. Dallas weather has a bad storm. Mm. So Dallas is going to be in the 20s to four, 40s. <laughs> this week, Dallas is going to be one degree on Monday. One degree. I, I, when I lived in Dallas five years, we never had one degree. The other team's going to Louisville. 
Louisville's conditions are also bad. Mm. So I just did a Zoom today, and guess what I said? I said, guys, this is the week to see who's going to make the least amount of excuses. Mm. Both of you are going to bad weather conditions. Both of you. But just like in sports, when they say that other team knows how to play in the cold weather, mm -hmm. they're going to win. We're about to find out which one of you guys can win mm -hmm. in cold weather and still make it happen, right? Okay. Which means what? Well, but you don't understand. The weather is cold, but you don't understand. Airports, but you don't understand, but you don't understand. You can say, but you don't understand for the rest mm -hmm. of your life with mom, dad, girlfriend, money, all this other stuff. But what you don't understand is you get to choose mm. what you do and how you handle that moving forward. So I'm not a big fan of alibis. I always put the pressure back on the person to say, at the end of the day, if you can, you know, small walk, talk, all that other stuff, you can go out there and do whatever you want to do with your life. I love it. So right now there's a guy He's 27 years old. Okay. He, let's say he went to school, didn't finish. Okay. He right now has a part-time job making about $25,000 a year. Okay. And he doesn't really have much drive in life. What is the first step that you're going to tell that man to do? Nothing. Mm. Nothing. Why does he not have drive in his life? So, so let me give it to you maybe from a different perspective. Okay. Um, my dad kept telling me I'm lazy as a kid because I was. Mm -hmm. I was bored half the time. Class, everything was boring to me. Mm -hmm. So eventually I go and I get a one point at GPA. I have a job at Hagen dazs and I worked my ass off at night from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock when everybody was asleep. I'd go grab a shopping cart and I would go into trash cans and I would find two liter bottles and cans. And then I would go to Albertson and I would recycle. So every night I was making 10 bucks a night mm. with my shopping cart that I had. 10 or 20, my friend and I would split it. He would get half, I would get half. And we'd collect them. Why are you guys, what are you guys doing? Because we wanted to buy cards. Mm. I wanted a Sergei Fedorov rookie card. I wanted a David Robinson 1989 Hoops rookie card. So my motivation was what? Cards at the time, mm. right? Okay. So later on, when I sat there and I'm like, you know, lazy, man. This topic keeps coming up. Lazy, lazy, lazy. Why are people lazy? Everything to me is linking a word to another word. When somebody says, man, Patrick, I, I'm owner of 100% of this company. We're doing $5 million a year. I want to bring another guy in, but I just don't feel like I can control. I'm, I feel like I want to control everybody. I said, can you tell me why you want to control everybody? Why? I said, what word links with control? Mm -hmm. The more you want to control somebody, the less you trust them. Mm -hmm. The less you want to control somebody, the more you trust them. Exactly. I say, you simply don't trust your people. Mm. So you got to figure out a way how much of that is on you, how much of that is on them. I say, oh, okay, that, that does kind of make sense. You find somebody that's bitter. Why is somebody bitter? You're not part of a community and you're not creating anything new. The moment you no longer create something of value to the world, you become bitter. Mm. Who's typically bitter? Old men. Old people. Mm. Why are they bitter? Because they're no longer contributing. Mm -hmm. You gotta figure out a way to get them to contribute, to feel like I am still needed in society. The world still needs me. Wouldn't die at 99. John D. Rockefeller, who was born in 1835, said, I'm gonna live 100 years, and I'm gonna make $100,000. He didn't make $100,000. In today's money, he made $340 billion. Do you know in 1835, the average life expectancy for a man was 39 and a half years old. You know how long he lived? 97 years and 11 months mm. because he kept contributing, okay? So, so when you look at this stuff and you're like, okay, well, here's what we got going on. How about this 27-year-old kid making 20, 25 grand a year, part-time job, and has no drive? He's bored out of his mind. Mm. You either need an enemy, you need a vision, you need somebody to tell you you can't do something. You need to put yourself in a position where somebody slaps you around that pisses you off and you wake up and you're like, wait a minute, what did you say? Yeah. I'm going to go out there and go to war and show you that I'm going to do something big with my life. But that 25-year-old is bored out of their minds. And quite frankly, many times there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. It has to come internal. Look, life is a test. You're being tested right now. I don't know how you're being tested right now, but somehow you're being tested. It could be personal, it could be family, it could be finance, it could be ego, it could be desires, it could be a vice. No one knows, but you're being tested. Mm -hmm. I'm being tested. She's being tested. He's being tested. There's not a person right now that's not being tested, right? Some of us don't pass the test. Mm. Who controls that? You do. Yeah. That's not on you and I. So that 25-year-old, that 27-year-old is being tested today. Mm. And he's failing today because mm. he has no desire to go out there and do something. He has to figure out a way to self-motivate himself right now. There's nothing you and I can do. At the end of the day, the individual has to want to help themselves. We can't make miracles. I, I can bring Tony Robbins, Joel Osteen, bring the, biggest, Eric, bring the biggest motivational speakers in the world, put them in a room of 1,000 people, 
and you're still going to have 80% of people that are going to do nothing when they leave that room. Mm. Numbers are numbers. That person's got to want it themselves. There's nothing you can do about it. Man, so the first time I met you, I remember you came in the room and there there was an energy shift in the room when you walked into the room. And uh, I only way I could describe it is like this dragon energy. It was like this powerful being. And the more I began to read and, and to learn, it, it, it's this sense of this masculine energy that you exude. And one of the things that I've, I was reading about is this masculine energy is this initiative, it's this drive, it's this passion. And, and you can just feel it when somebody walks in the room to which I believe you said like in part of your family crest is a lion. Did you communicate that? And that's what it embodies, right? This fierce, ferocious competitor go-getter. And, and you're 100% right. For a lot of these young men, they don't have that in them. You know, they don't have it in them. And so I know you said there's nothing that we can do about it, but have you seen anybody go from very passive and lazy and then awaken that inner lion? Myself. Okay. Myself. Mm -hmm. that, see, the reason why I believe people change is because I've witnessed my life. If you were to, you know, one of the things I did a few years ago, I brought up my former sergeant from the army, mm. okay? And I, I put him on stage. I said, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who I was in the Army? And he started telling stories. I ended up bringing my sister into the business with me. She's one of our vice presidents now, Paula and Siamak. They, they do a great job. They're one of the vice presidents in That's the awesome. company. And I told everybody, go ask my sister anything you want to ask about how I was. And I said, Paulette, say whatever you want to say. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And she would say, Pat was lazy. Pat was this. Yeah, no, totally fine. I, I'm okay. Then I brought another friend who from the military, and people would ask him the questions. Hey, how was Pat? How was this? How was that? I don't have any problems with that. Then I went and called. One of my friends called me one time. I'll never forget this. His name is Adrian. And he said, hey, can we go out to lunch? And we went out to lunch. This was even 12 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe even before like I was online anything. And he says, Pat, can I tell you something? I said, yeah. At the time, I'm probably making a quarter million to a half a million dollars when him and I are having this conversation in my late 20s. He says... Uh, I'm going to tell you something that most of your friends are not going to tell you. So what's that, Adrian? He says, Pat, I never thought you were going to make it. Mm. I'm not one of these guys that's going to tell you. I know Pat was going to make it. He says, Pat, I never thought you were going to make it. Yeah. I never thought you could know anything with your life. When you went into the Army, I thought that was it. Like, you're going to go make 38 grand, 40 grand, and that's it. Wow. He says, I am shocked at who you became. Okay, perfect. So now flip it. You asked me the question with this 25-year-old. I'm telling you, I didn't have any fire. Mm. I didn't have any fire. One day... Uh, I'm at UCLA Medical Center in LA. My dad has a heart attack. You've heard me tell this story before. My dad has a heart attack. And you know, my dad is like, my dad's. At this time, I'm partying five, six days a week. I'm in Vegas every other weekend. So I go to the hospital and I see him. And I see him laying in bed and the nurse, he's calling the nurse, not showing up. The nurse gave him a little bit of an attitude and that's when I lost it. Mm. I'm calling out the nurse, just acting fully irresponsible at the house. My dad is panicking, Patrick, please calm down, please calm down, and he just had a heart attack. Just foolish, mm -hmm. absolutely. F There's nothing about my behavior that was acceptable, except the fact that I wanted my dad to get better service, right? Mm -hmm. So th eventually they kicked me out. Mm -hmm. I get kicked out of the hospital, I can't go visit my dad. They wow. kick me out of the hospital, and you know I get in my car, Ford Focus, and I sit there, and I cry for 30 straight minutes, mm -hmm. okay? The next day, I told my friends, never ever call me again to go to clubs. Mm. Pat, come on, man, what are you talking about? I said, don't ever call me again, I'm not going. You're not gonna see me at the clubs anymore. I'm not gonna party with you, I'm not gonna go to clubs with you. Pat, you're out of your mind, there's no way in the world. You can stop, we all know who you are, because I was great at the party inside. You will never stop. I said, okay, I'm mm. just telling you, don't call me anymore. So they started calling me. Mm. One month, two months, three months, six months, guess what happened? Never went to the clubs ever again. That night decision was made. The old Pat died. I killed mm. the old Pat. Give you another part of the story here. One day, I'm sitting there. I'm like, why do I drink? I don't know why I'm drinking. I'm done with alcohol. Mm. I dropped alcohol and I stopped drinking. Now, this is coming from a guy that every weekend in the army, I would drink two bottles of tequila mm. when I would go to the clubs. We would drive from Kentucky all the way up to Nashville, Tennessee, mix factory connections, Silverados, all this stuff. And by the time we got there, we're hammered. If you see most of my military pictures in Nashville, if there's any military picture mm -hmm. you see out of my album in Nashville, I am hammered. Mm. And you'll see it on the look of my face. Mm. To all of a sudden saying, dude, I'm done, mm. okay? 
and to me saying no sex for 17 months until I make my money. I made some drastic decisions. Mm. Who can't do that? They can do that. You control the choice. See, the reason why capitalism is a beautiful thing is because of four things. You have the freedom to buy whatever you want to buy that's legal. You have the freedom to sell whatever you want to sell that's legal. You have the freedom to try whatever you want. You don't want to do real estate? Try insurance. You don't want to do insurance? Try digital market. You don't want to go try YouTube? You can try anything you want. Mm -hmm. But you know what the last one is? The freedom to fail. Mm. We don't give enough credit to this. The reason why certain people in the wor world are respected and admired at the level that they are is because so many people fail. Because mm. when the pressure hits, most people leave the arena. Mm. We all root for the people in the arena and we criticize them. What we don't recognize is the fact that whoever is in the arena getting their asses handed to them, at least they had the courage to get in the arena. Mm. They're not fans on the outside. They're in the arena fighting. Those are the people we admire. So th these young guys that you're talking about, Pat, you know, a lot of people don't have the drive. I wish you knew me in, your, in my early 20s. You would have had more confidence in people being able to ship because I had to choose. One thing happened. Next thing, I'm a whole different person. I love that, man. Yeah. That, that message, that I hope, hope the guys took that to heart. And so one of the, one of the things is there's a, a lot of conversations about, you know, the behaviors of very successful men. And, um, you know, and, and I always said there's, there's levels to the game. You know, there's, there's the guys that, you know, there's the hundred thousands, there's a million, there's a the 10 million, you know, cat. Pat's at the top of the level. You know what I mean? Pat is a guy who is an extremely successful man. A lot of people will show things on social media, but Patrick, hands down, successful man that you cannot deny. So one of the questions that people always ask is, what is the incentive of a very successful, especially financially successful man to settle down and become and get married? So I'm very curious about from good your question. personal pers perspective as a man who was being successful, who, who had an onward trajectory, who was doing so well, what made you decide to, to get married? The risk is very high, by the way, to mm -hmm. get married. You know, for, for me, when I was 28, I had made a decision I'm never going to get married. I oh, said, wow. I'm, I'm staying single. And uh, my uh, assistant, very good friend of mine at that time, Sandra, Patty, said, why don't you go read this book, 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged by mm -hmm. Norman Wright. So I read the book. When I read the book, I'm like, huh, interesting. I was talking to four girls at the time. I said, why don't you guys read this book as well and see how you feel about it? <laughs> so they did. I'm like, I could never be with you. You and I would never work out, would never work out. But I asked the one question, why get married? There's way too much risk to it. So then I sat there and said, well, you have somebody to come home to every night. You can still have somebody to come <laughs> home to if you're single. Yeah. Matter of fact, you can have options. Yeah. If you, you know what I mean? When you have the money, you can do whatever you want to do with that. Yeah. But uh, tax benefits, I don't care about that. I can move to another state and get better tax <laughs> benefits. It's, it's somebody that you're, uh, you know, uh, it's somebody that can help you. It's somebody that can do this. Mm, not, not there yet. And then you, it goes to, okay, look, you can make all the money in the world. Then what? Like what leaves you? A book? Yeah, they say the Jewish proverb says there's three things every man should do. Write a book, plant a tree, have a son. Mm. Why? because they all outlive you. Mm. We as men want to live thousands of years. Mm. The only way you're gonna live thousands of years is by the value you bring to the world that's documented, mm -hmm. is by giving back to, and, and I know the tree is what they're saying with tree, not even tree today, because a tree is being cut down and turned into paper. It's a <laughs> yeah. business model now, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's family, it's mm. blood. And when you see your kid and you find somebody to build a family with that's a good partner, meshes with you, good personality, you sit there and say, okay, great, this looks good. We can actually pull this off. Then there's value for it. But I'm gonna tell you something here right now. Basic rules about getting married today. Wouldn't get, I, if I'm a man, I'm not getting married before 30 at all. Mm. I would not even think about getting married pre-30. A lot of people argue with me. You don't know what you're talking about. I got married at 22 years old and I'm happily married, I'm 62. Mm. 22. 62 that was 40 years ago that means the 80s yeah you didn't have social media you didn't have snapchat you didn't have tinder you don't have accessibility to what's out there today mm. accessibility to sex today is so easy mm. the ability to be tempted today and screw up is so easy mm. the ability to screw up and make a royally publicly humiliating mistake today is very high mm. and a no man walk on water mm. okay and no man walks on water everybody sees and says, oh my gosh oh she's beautiful but i'm married there's nobody that's perfect to say, oh, I don't have to worry about the mistakes I'm gonna make. Mm -hmm. The risk is high today. 
the reward is not as high as it used to be mm-hmm. because at least back in the days, you know, back in the days, say you and your wife got into a fight 20 years ago. You got a 30 minute drive, okay? And at the office, you talk to her. Why well, don't I come home and talk to you tonight? You got 30 minutes to calm down by the time you come home. Mm-hmm. Today, if you get into a fight, instantly that mm. second what you want to say you say so yeah. you offend you offend you offend you offend scar 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 mm. it's just like dude i'm so done with this marriage so today we have too much of the opportunity to react instantly there's too much instant reaction and hey you don't know what you're talking about that fight is too instant so those are all scars that you're leaving on each other right mm. and eventually after all the scars you get it's like i i just I, I just have no desire to do anything with you in bed anymore i mm. really don't i'm good i'm just you're facing this way She's facing that way. So it has to be built on the right values and principles. It has to be somebody that you date for some time and you see all the dark side of them and yourself to see if you can do this or not. Preferably a referral that's coming through somebody instead of cold. Mm. Uh, I knew my wife five and a half years before we got married. She knew my flaws, I knew her flaws. Oh yeah, she dated other guys, I dated other girls and eventually we said, let's see what could happen here and we build a family together. You have to create certain criterias uh, before you, and when you get married, watch the fights, watch the arguments, watch how people argue. I remember one time my wife, we were dating, and she is about to lose uh, financially. She wasn't the best of place at that time. Certain you know challenges took place. She was in a mortgage real estate business, and one month she calls. We've been together for three months. She says, "You know, this month I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent." I'm like, ooh, <laughs> okay, let's see where this goes. Yeah. She, I don't know, I'm gonna pay my rent. I'm like, really? Yeah. Hmm. What are you thinking you're gonna do? I don't know. What do you think I should do? I said, well, number one, I would go return your BMW that you have. That's $850 a month car payment, white convertible. I'd go return that and say, can't pay the payment anymore. Mm. What else would you do? Number two, I'd go back and I would get a Nissan Sentra $200 a month. That saves you 600 bucks a month. Mm. okay what else would you do i'd go back and i know you're doing insurance and real estate right now i'd go back and get your old job where you worked to give you a good shift where they can pay you forty thousand dollars that at least covers your uh, uh what do you call it expenses what else would you do boom 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 i said what i said and she says okay mm. i said what do you mean let's go return the car i said you sure <laughs> that day yeah. we drove to bmw she returned her car then we drove up to centra she got the centra then she went back to her job and she got mm. a job and she so i said Never once did she say, can you lend me 1250 bucks? Not mm. one time. So to me, that was like, okay, because my biggest concern was, oh, I have money, so you're kind of trying to. Yeah. Never yeah. did that. And I said, she has no clue. She just passed an incredible test <laughs> for us, right? Yeah. So I, it's, it's very risky, and there is no 100%. Everything about marriage today is odds. And sometimes you can have a fight that no matter what, you know, Kansas City Chiefs are supposed to win the Super Bowl, <laughs> and Brady could still win. So you can still. Do all of it right, mm-hmm. and the odds are in your favor for this marriage to work. It could still fail. Yeah, no, that 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 is um, a conversation that we're always having, and I think to me, similar to you, I think the advantage of a man's ability to raise his son is so important in today, especially as the world gets more and more crazier. I just think, you know, that's one of the incentives for me is that like similar to how my father was able to be in my life. And I know you shared a story last time on the podcast, how having that one week with your dad, one day a week with your dad really shaped your life. And I always said that I grew up very rich and people are like, oh my gosh, you know, you're spoiled. How much cards? You're like, no, 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 we, my parents, we're, we're immigrants. We had no money. But my dad gave me so much love and time. Powerful, and that's man. and that was the richness that I grew up with. So yeah. for me, the, the beauty and value is in that for marriage. And so you made a point about criteria for selecting a wife. So if your son was 32 years old, you know, he established himself financially, you you see he's doing well and, you, yeah. and he's trying to settle down, what would, would be three criteria that you give him for a wife that comes off the top of your mind? Yeah, so first of all, you have to be physically attracted. So I'm, that's not even one of the three, but you do have to be physically attracted. Okay. So the whole idea about, well, it doesn't matter. Oh, no, it, it, it matters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it matters. And by the way, my wife and I, till today, we talk and we say, hey, you know, we have to stay in shape for each other. We have mm-hmm. to be attractive to each other. You know, we have to want to have sex with each other because mm-hmm. that is a very important part of marriage. So it's not like uh, 280 pounds, but you said through thick and thin. Yeah, it's a little too much thick right now and I'd like some thin, right, you know? But, you know, so so that is a part and sometimes men let themselves go and you see, you know, they got a big pouch, but you know, but you're my wife. That's not how things work. You know, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to. So 
But let's set that part aside. Let's set that part aside. Um, for me, number one would be values and principles. And I'll explain to you from my parents' standpoint. My parents, my, both my parents are Christians, right? But why did you get a divorce? Here's why. My mom was a communist. Mm. My dad was an imperialist. Mm. My mother believed rich people were bad people. Mm. My dad thought poor people were lazy. Mm. Look how big of a conflict that is. Yeah. So my dad's trying to become rich, but that's who my mom hates. Mm. How can your husband become exactly what you hate? The more my dad's aspiring to become rich, the more you despise rich people. Mm. Why would he become rich? You don't like rich people. Mm. I don't know if that made sense or not. Yeah, it makes so it's kind of like, dude, I'm, I'm trying to really give you the life, but she despises rich people. Mm. So values and pr principles. To me, politics is almost more important than religion. Mm. People say, why would you say that? That's so weird. Okay, so if a Christian marries a Catholic, yeah, they're both Christians, a little bit different. If a Christian marries a, you know, a Jew, okay, one's a Christian, one's a Jew. But it's very different, Patrick. I get it. Mm -hmm. But Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments, yeah, okay? Yeah. Same values and principles in that area, but economically, if you believe certain economy is going to be one way and she believes in a different way, if you believe politically one side and she believes, you're causing too many fights mm. and you're causing way too many things for kids to also have more fights with. So philosophically, you got to be on the same page. You know, the, the magic, the excitement's got to be there when you're around each other. It's not going to be like that forever because, you know, when you have kids, you can't have sex for three months. And it's going to be a lot of things that's going to hurt the magic at times. But there's got to be that twinkle where you're like, man, I can't wait to see. I can't wait to go have that dinner with her, right? And, uh, and then, you know, ask a lot of questions up front. Man, I asked, I said, so let me ask you this. Yeah, what are we going to do one day if this happens? What would you do? One time I asked my wife, I said, let me ask you, if we get into a big fight, okay, terrible fight, I'm talking horrible fight we're together for nine months when i asked this question i said uh, who would you call she said i would call this person that person this person this person this person i said okay so i got a paper and pen on tell me about this person are they married no she's divorced okay come tell me about this person tell me about that person i said i said yeah i'm not ready to get married mm. she says why not i said because everybody you call is going to defend you mm. and they need to defend me mm. but everyone's going to defend you she says, what do you mean? Who are you going to call if we get into a fight? I said, let me tell you who. I said, Dudley, my dad, and I went through a list of the names that I would call. I said, you know what every one of these guys would defend? Who? You. Mm. They would all say I messed up to come and apologize to you. I said, you see, the challenge is if I have way too many divorced friends, divorced friends like to recruit mm. people to the divorce community. Wow. Married people like to recruit people to the married community. Mm -hmm. Single people like to recruit people to what? single community we're all recruiters by the way mm -hmm, yeah. so so when you get married it's very important that most of the people you're around is also what like yeah, you yeah. or else you're going to be tempted so i made the list she made the list so you guys got to have the conversation we ask and say hey, if something happens who are you going to call and then i'm telling you 90 percent of the questions you're asking me is in 101 questions to ask before you get engaged baggage what do you bring to the table you know what what, what things do i have to worry about exes are you comfortable with a kid I guess the last one I would add with you would be the following. Create a list of your three non-negotiables, mm -hmm. which means, look, no matter what, we have to be both same faith, hypothetically. No matter what, you can't have any kids. No matter what, you can't be married before. Or no matter what, you can't have this. No matter, create your three no matter what, and don't create a 20 no matter what. Mm -hmm. Only three no matter what. So you gotta think about all the no matter what's and then uh, narrow it down to what? Three. Once you have your three, never compromise the three. Mm. Many people do, mm. just because the sex is good, yeah. or just because she's too pretty, mm. or just because he's way handsome, mm. or just because, you know, you cannot compromise your non-negotiables. When I'm running a company, a guy came up and he says, hey, Pat, let's do a deal on the side. I'm gonna pay you a million dollars a year. Mm. And this is when I was smaller. He said, I'm gonna pay you a million dollars a year. No one's gonna know. Let's do a side contract. I said, you know what's crazy? He says, what's that? He says, I said, you have no idea how much I need that million yeah. right now. He says, I said, you have no idea how much I need that million right now. I'm yeah. telling you, I need that million right now because I'm bleeding. Yeah. I said, but do you know if one of my guys finds out who's loyal to me, that I did a side deal with them with you, even though I've never known you before, we just started like six months ago. Mm -hmm. I said, I lose trust with all, I said, I can't do that. It's part of my non-negotiable. I mm -hmm. said, I can't do it. I said, I appreciate the offer, but I cannot take you on that. He wow. was blown away. Yeah. Because everybody else said, <laughs> because one of my non-negotiable was win your existing loyal people over and never disrespect them. Mm. Always protect them. Once you do that and you go into a marriage, you know, you're, Hopefully the odds will be on your side, but still it's very important to know 
there is no perfect perfection when it comes down to that. Yeah. If you wait for that part, you'll never. If you actually do want to get married, mm -hmm. there is no perfection. Yeah. There is risk. Yeah. There is concern. Your heart could be broken. Yeah. Things could go wrong. Yeah. But you're just hoping the odds are on, are on your side. No, that's that's great. And something else that you said stood out to me when we first met. So um, recently you announced that your wife is pregnant with twins. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Bet the David family keeps on growing. I love the legacy that you're leaving behind. And um, you made a point that you said that you take it one year at a time. Every year, one year at yep. a time. So right now your wife is on the way to have your fifth kid. And so is there ever a sense where it's like you know that – she's on this team for life or are you still taking it one year at a time of course it's one year at a time yeah of course it's one year at a time. by the way i appreciate that although uh, uh uh eight weeks ago we went to the doctor and when we did the ultrasound one of the babies died oh, so I'm one of the twins didn't make it i appreciate that but uh we are having a baby and we're excited about it and god knows how much we prayed about uh, uh the entire event that took place it's been a very interesting pregnancy compared to the others but uh, yeah, of course, there's still, you know, who knows what's going to happen. We're yeah. still taking it one year at a time. I mean, yeah. you've got to know that we've moved now 10 times in 11 years of being married. Wow. And to three different states. Mm. So it's not like we moved from here to across the street. Mm, yeah. We moved f six times in California, then three times in, in, you know, Texas, then one time in Florida. And it's constantly. So there's a lot of pressure. And I'm not going to slow down. So it's not like <laughs> I'm going to be yeah. this person that's going to be home. I'm still going to play offense. And, you know, she's going to have her own changes as a human being that takes place. I can't predict the future. Mm. But where we are right now, we're in a very good place right now. That's awesome. But every year, we take it one year at a time because you're not somebody that can, Nostradamus, where you can predict the future. You just do your best to have the odds be on your side. Yeah. And then hopefully, eventually, one day you wake up, you're like, uh, we're celebrating 50 years? Yeah, pretty crazy. <laughs> Never thought this would happen. Yeah. Never thought this would happen, so. No, that's amazing. So the last thing um, as we wrap it up is I feel like 2020, I don't want to use the word evolution because I feel like the word evolution is kind of setting to a set, but it was the becoming, in my opinion, of the next phase of Patrick Bet David. I saw a shift in regards to the content. I saw a shift in regards to the the comfortability even though i always say you're one of the best interviewers of all time and one of the best teachers of all time i i saw you in your element with the podcast i saw you in your element with more of the, the videos and and to me it was a beautiful um uh, metamorphosis to experience and so i'm curious to what went on in 2020 which i felt like there was like all this weight that you were carrying, you just l you let it go and you just fully show the world, no, this is who I am. I don't care what you think and I'm gonna let you know what I think about life. Yeah, yeah there's risk to that today, by the way. 100%. But for me, uh, for me, I, I don't know any other way of living because, so, so you've noticed I've used the word odds a lot mm. lately. That's odds, odds, marriage, odds. All these things are odds, right? Mm. Okay, so when... Um, I got to a point in 2013, 2014, for about a year and a half, I kept questioning my ability to be a CEO. Mm. So the most common question I ask at 2013, 2014 is, am I a great sales leader or am I a great CEO? I don't know. Mm. I know I'm a great salesperson. I know I'm a great sales leader. I don't yet know if I'm a great CEO, mm -hmm. okay? And there was a lot of criticism saying from my own folks, two mm. guys specifically, you know, you know what you're doing, this is, I'm like, okay, great. So I question myself. In mid-2014, I sat there and I said, if I've ever done anything in my life, you guys are going to be shell-shocked by how much I'm going to double down on exactly what bothers you the most, mm. which were some of these guys that didn't like the way I led. I doubled down on it. Mm. And they said, wait a minute, you're still doing it. I said, this is, this, is who I'm, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to be doing. Mm. Next thing you know, the company went from doing $5 million a year, $10 million a year, $20 million a year, $40 million a year, $70 million a year. Growing year after year after year after year. And then you saw by Tim and go from, you know, 50 thou, quarter million, half, a mil, two million. Now it's about to cross three million. But I realized my philosophies are getting clearer in life. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not going to sit there and debate you on energy because I don't have a clear philosophy on energy. I'm not going to sit here and debate you on 
you know, certain topics that I have no strong opinions on. Mm -hmm. But the areas that I have strong opinions on, yeah, I'm very comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And my philosophy is getting more clearer for me. When your philosophy gets clear in your, in your life on how you lead, how you raise kids, how you deal with finances, how you deal with crisis, how you deal with all that other stuff, your confidence goes higher. Now, I'll give you another part as well on what happened. Competition when you first start, you know, at the beginning, like let's just say you and I get into a Coldwell Banker office or a Keller Williams office or a Morgan Stanley office and we're both 23 with a new, you know, young stars that are coming in. Mm -hmm. You came out of a big school. I came out of a big school. You're competitive. I'm competitive. You come at 5 o'clock. I'm trying to come in at 4.59. Mm -hmm. Next day, you come in at 4.49 and you have sweat because you just finished the gym. I'm like, dude, I'm going to kick his ass. I'm coming at 4.30. Mm -hmm. So we're coming up, right? And we work. You're one. You beat me. Okay? Mm -hmm. You're two. You beat me. Because that's based on what? Work. Mm -hmm. You're simply outworking me. Mm -hmm. You're three. You beat me. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, you're at a $300,000 a year income. I'm at 220. Mm. Then at $300,000 a year income, you start liking golf too much. Mm. Then at a $300,000 a year income, you're going to the clubs and you're doing bottle service and mm. you're getting that. So your 300 becomes, two fi becomes 350. Mm. My 200 becomes 400. Mm. My 400 becomes 800. Mm. My 800 becomes 1.6. Now your 350 is at 500. Then all of a sudden I'm making 3 million. You're at 620. We're not in the same league anymore. We don't belong to the same clubs. Mm. If I'm at three million, you're at six twenty. It's not the same community. It's not the same conversations about investments. It's a very different conversation. The people that I play poker with on Friday nights in my community are different than the people you play poker on Friday night in your community. Mm -hmm. But at one point, you whooped my ass. So what happened here? So the the most important area that gave me a lot of confidence is I'm going to tell you is this. So first thing is outwork. We come into the Morgan Stanley office, Keller Williams office, you outwork me. The first year, second year, third. So in the first three years, it looks like you're going to kill me long term. Mm -hmm. Second one is out improve. We improved steadily the first two years. After the third year, you stop reading books the way you used to. So now I got an edge over you on reading. Even though you're smarter than me and better than me, talented wise. But I'm now about improving you a little bit more. Next one is strategizing. Out strategize, that doesn't happen overnight. Strategy typically takes five to 10 years. Mm. So you have to be competing for five to 10 years to come up with newer strategies because you know, people don't even know what's a struggle. What do I do with strategy in real estate or investment bank or YouTube or social media? You don't know those strategies mm. yet, right? Then the last one is what gave me confidence in 2000. Mm -hmm. And you know what the last one is? Outlast. Outlasting. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you. <laughs> One time, a girl got up on stage. It's got the chills all over me. Look at this. Look at this. Look I at see this. it. One time, I got up on stage, and this girl called me out. We were competing. And later on that night, we were having dinner. I said, let me tell you something. I said, there's one secret you don't know about competition and me, and that you will never beat me long term. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, I mean, you know, you got to realize I'm extremely competitive already at 42, but I was out of control in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. Like, out of control. Yeah. If you said you could beat me in my 20s, you don't even know what it did to <laughs> me on how competitive I was yeah. after what happened to my dad. Because in my mind, it's not about beating you. In my mind is, there's no way in the world you're going to prevent me from giving my dad everything he wants in life. Mm. You were in the way, if that makes any sense. It makes perfect so sense. So to you, you were really calling my dad out. That's when I'm just going to go double mm. down, right? Girl said, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. I said, so let me put it to you this way. I said, you know what's the difference between me and you? What's that? I will never stop. Mm. You're eventually going to stop. Mm -hmm. Odds are against you. I will never stop. Mm. And the moment you realized, in 20, I realized in 2020, this game is about the last one. That's the real battle. Yeah. That's when you realize your competition is not even 1%. Mm. It's a very small community because most people are going to celebrate with certain cars, women, accolades, money, savings, articles written about you. I don't really, you know, it's because the bigger play is permanent. Mm. The bigger legacy doesn't last a year. Oh, did you see that viral article? No, 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 no. Reagan's forever going to be remembered. You know, there are Rockefellers are forever going to be remembered. The Kennedy legacy family is forever going to be remembered. Not, not 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. They can, as long as the Armageddon doesn't come around 1,000 mm -hmm. years from now, we're going to know the Kennedy legacy, yeah. right? So that's the part where you find that at the end of the day, the biggest thinkers win 
the biggest thinkers win because the biggest thinkers can last longer than you can. Mm. Most people can, not you, I'm saying generally yeah, yeah, like course. anybody is. Like a test where people say, oh my gosh, you see that guy's killing it on you know podcasts, or that guy's killing it on, so that guy's killing real estate, that guy's killing Relax, yeah. way too early. Yeah. This is a 20 year race. Okay. We don't even know what's going on. Some of the people that were big 10 years ago, ain't nobody talking about them today. This is a long race. So the confidence in 2020 came knowing I can last. And I, by the way, you said levels. Patrick's pretty much all the way at the top of the level. I'm not. Yeah. I am at two, three levels below some of the guys. Say put Musk at the top with, uh, what do you call it? With uh, Bezos. Bezos, those yeah. two guys are at the top. And you're probably going to have to put Ellison there. You're going to have to put Zuck there. You're going to have to put Buffett there, Gates there. there there's, there's a community mm -hmm. there, right? Then there's a the next level. I'm probably tier four or five. I got work to do to get up there. Mm -hmm. 42 years old. Am I at the top for 42 year old? Am I? In, yes, 42 year olds above everybody. No, I'm competing. The best part is knowing no matter how well you're doing, never believe in the hype that you've already made it. Mm. If you feel you've made it, you lost the game already. Mm. You're never gonna compete with the guys at the top because everyone's gonna tell you, dude, you're amazing, dude, you're killing it, dude, you're this. You almost have to be deaf when you hear that from people. You can't hear that because that's the last thing you want to hear. Now, you came in here, I told you, listen, you guys are doing a great job with your podcast, all this other stuff. This is coming from a guy that we have a relationship with and so why, So this guy's seeing what we're doing? Yeah, of course, I respect you, salute. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, that compliment's coming from what? Somebody that's been in the game and kind of knows what's going on and you're going to get two million subs no matter what you already know you're going to get two million mm -hmm. subs it's not like you're what we're going to celebrate you know you're going to get two million subs yeah but everybody else that tells you how amazing you are yeah man mute man patrick it is an honor it is a privilege to have you back on the show i think the the, the closing message that you shared was so powerful because i tell men this all the time life is a marathon not a sprint and that's the message that I, I we emphasize the message we focus on. And thank you so much for sharing that wisdom. Guys, time. make sure you get Patrick's book, Your Next Five Moves. If you haven't gotten it already, please, please make sure that you get it. Patrick, where can they find you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, I mean, you can uh, you go on YouTube, you type in Value Tim, and you'll find the channel. But if you send me a tweet at Patrick Bed David Handel, I'll respond in the book they can buy on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, even at the physical Barnes & Noble stores. Yeah, Patrick, thank you so much. Anytime, brother. My name is Hafiz, and I'm joined by... Patrick Bed David. We are the roommates, guys. Thank you so much. Make sure you send Patrick a tweet, let him know the love, and get that book, guys. Hope this episode has blessed you as much as it blessed me, and have a great day. Take care.